welcome to another round of Excello Best Practices webinars. Uh, this is the second round of webinars we've been running, focusing on setting up users and their permissions. I'm your host, Tom. I'm also joined by Saga Gupta, who works in client success and will be uh, presenting today's uh, webinar. For we'll, We're going to quickly run through uh, an agenda at the, the top here and just a few kind of basic high-level slides. Uh, and then we're going to jump into Excel and do a little bit more practical work here. So just quickly going over the agenda here, um, we're going to run through adding in a user and some of the basics around that, uh, understanding and, and utilizing groups within Excel and the permissions that go along with that, and then setting up these permissions both at an individual level uh, as well as a user group level. If you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to put them in the Q&A section of uh, the Zoom account, and we'll try and answer them along the way. If we don't get to them along the way, we'll leave some time at the end. Uh, and if we run out of time there, um, feel free to submit them to us directly and we can get back to you with that. Okay, throwing it over to Saga here, let's get going. Okay, so your first action item is to add in a user. So common scenarios are first, you know, if you have a brand new user that's coming on board, one of your staff members hasn't been added just yet, or potentially for this webinar also, you might be editing current users. So there's three things to keep in mind that are more, maybe less intuitive than the other settings when adding in a brand new user. The first one is rates. So you have a billable rate and a cost rate per user. So the billable rate is the billable value of work each time that user logs time. So think of your hourly billable value. Your cost rate, is an internal cost rate and potentially an admin overhead percentage, so it's like 15 to 20% on average, that you'd like to have to track profitability for a given project. So an example would be, say you have an intern and they're billing at a rate of say $30 an hour, and then their cost rate would be $15 an hour to your internal team. Anytime they log time, you'll know you have a $15 profit margin. Next, we'll go on to financial visibility. And this is really important and done during adding in a brand new user or editing a current user. So there's two options, hours, rates, budgets, and hours only. So hours, rates, and budgets allows a user to kind of basically manage make, or create projects and retainers because you need to know the different rates per task and milestone as well as say for a retainer, you need to know what is say the staff cost rate, or sorry, staff billable rate, as well as say the prepaid allowances and such. Okay, so hours only would mainly be, you know, individuals that have no, you know, basically your end users that are assigned out tasks and don't necessarily need to know the rates and the budgets. They're not the ones invoicing um, and they're just kind of doing their work, okay? Last but not least, you have access level. So you have four levels of access level. One is admin, professional, collaborator, and contractor. Think of admin, you're thinking of your major users, think of your executives, managing directors, chiefs, um, and essentially they can see both you know, the billable rate, but also the cost rate. Again, the cost rate is not shown to professional, collaborator, or contractor users. Again, because we don't want to show, say, a salaried rate of the rest of the team. Admin users also get to see the utilization and profitability dashboards. They can see everyone's timesheets um, and other aspects of things, such as setting up permissions and doing bulk exports. Okay. So your professional users are mainly your day-to-day, -day, full-time members of your staff that are doing the work, managing the work, and so on. You have collaborators, which are your read-only users. So think of your accountants. Um, or think of your office manager that's just coming in to kind of just look at what work is there. You know, we've seen, you know, say board of directors um, and other sorts of more like say investors can join um, your platform as a collaborator. Last but not least, you have a contractor. So think of individuals that are kind of just there for maybe a specific project or they're part-time to work on you know, a few projects based on the skill level. They can only see what has been assigned to them and maybe the clients that are you know, they have a task assigned for. Okay. The next action item would be to add in a user group. So you have different user groups. So if you're thinking about maybe your project managers versus your developers um, versus say your, your UI team, 
or you can do it say by, by role, say your executives um, or your you know, contractors could be a full on group as well as other types of, again, maybe like think of a hierarchy of users. So essentially a user can be in multiple different groups. And the reason we say that is because you can manage permissions at a group level as well as an individual level. So if we're adding in a user, adding them to a group, there's three things to keep in mind. First is as you're adding in a user, you have the user access and financial visibility. So again, thinking about that, you know, admin versus professional versus, you know, seeing billing and rates versus just seeing hours. Next, you can go into the group permissions and then you go into user permissions. So again, the more access you're given um, or the more groups you're in, the more access you have, you can manually give a specific user additional um, visibility on certain things. So, last slide here, so you have common users. So if you think of your managing director, project manager, end user, now what's kind of a, a basic structure, kind of a skeleton structure of each of these users? Your managing director will normally be an admin user, only have all the permissions, kind of like an executive group and then financial visibility, okay? You have project managers, so think of a professional user, again, your everyday full-time employee, um, you have basically no delete permissions. That's kind of the main thing that separates, um, you know, managing director from say a project manager, as well as all the other admin related functionality missing. They'll be part of the project management group and they have financial visibility. Next, you have your end user. Think of a professional. Um, they have no admin rights, triggers, delete or view access. So they can only see things that they've been assigned to. Um, and they have no financial visibility. Okay. You have an accountant, again, as I mentioned, as a collaborator, they have all permissions, um, but you know they can't log time or work because it, it limits it from a collaborator standpoint, and they do have financial visibility. And a contractor, you have a contractor license, generally you have, don't have permissions besides what you've been assigned to, um, and you do not have financial visibility. So together, we're gonna go in and, and just an example um, say project manager, as we call implementation manager, one of our colleagues, Adam, that you may have worked with in the past. So we're going into one of our test deployments. So what we're gonna do is first hit that top left button. Then go ahead and hit configurations. So we're going to, to go into the users and groups. We're gonna click on users. Let's open up another tab for each one of these, just for quickly referencing each one. Okay, so if you remember, you know, we wanna have these user groups that they're added into and then the user, but first, okay, we need to start with a user. So for the first name, So the first functional field is the managed by, and this is basically who is Adam reporting to? Say it could be you know, Jeff or another member of our you know, administrative team. And the idea is that person can get CC in all communications that Adam sends out of Excel or logs. So essentially when you have a brand new member of the team, you may wanna see what emails they're sending out or what calls they're logging and notes they're logging, just to make sure they're on the right path forward um, and there's nothing, there's no red flags in that front. Okay. You can have a skill level, get, you know, separate this individual from other individuals on your team. And then we go into the, you know, the first action item into different rates. So as we mentioned, you can have you know, different billable rate and cost rate. If you think of a billable rate, again, this is your default billable rate. So if you go into the different objects, say your projects, tickets and retainers, you might be choosing the staff rate as what you're gonna be billing for. But in this case, we can just go ahead and choose, you know, say, project management. So Adam manages our implementation projects. We could consider him a project manager at $150 an hour as a billable rate. Again, this can be overrided from any one of these objects. You can also have the default cost rate. So if you're thinking of what is Adam's cost to our company, and that includes, again, his salary and his, say, overhead. Again, I don't personally know Adam's salary, but let's go ahead and say he's a junior professional joining our team recently. Okay. 
couple more things. So you have email sending. So for looking at email sending, you can have three options. So user's own email address, using a specific email address for that activity. So think of activity plus five, six, seven, eight for sending out an email to a client. So you don't necessarily, you mask what email that Adam is sending. Or you can use a specific alias. So if you're thinking at team at googly.com, as the account we're using right now, or team at excel.com, and it'll mask Adam's email anytime he sends an email. You can go ahead and choose what the username is. So Excel, you have financial visibility. So say view hours, billable rates, and financial budgets, and view hours only. Since Adam is leading our implementation projects, he's also invoicing for them. So we're gonna give him access because he needs the one setting up the different project plans. He's invoicing, again, two things that need to have financial visibility. And then you can go into different groups. So in this case, he's part of the staff group. We're gonna take a look at the different groups and examples of groups in just a few minutes. And you have access level. So Adam, as an implementation manager, doesn't necessarily need to see cost rates of other individuals. Um, he doesn't need to be the one setting up configurations and such. And if you do, we can always give him access afterwards. So we're going to make him a professional license. Okay, and you know he's starting today, so let's give him an active user license. So now that we've added in a user, we're not prompted to give him user permissions. So basically from this screen, you can have just tell there's a lot of just different modules and features that we wanna get permissions for, for a given individual. Before we do that, if you remember back when we were looking at the slides, we wanna add Adam into a group and manage permissions from a group, but then give additional functionality to Adam through his user profile based on what he needs to do. So if we look at the different examples of groups within Excel, we can think of, to your business development, contractors, copywriting, creative executives. Some individuals can go into say multiple categories. So for example, you can have a head of creative. They can be both in the creative division, they can be in the executives division, and they can even be in the project management division. So in that case, when you have permissions that are based on groups, they can be in you know, multiple different groups, but the total permissions or the community cumulative permissions all add up as say building blocks. So one on top of the other. Just because one group doesn't have a certain permission doesn't mean that individual doesn't have a permission, doesn't have that permission if he's part of a different group, as an example. So you know, using this example, you have say staff and you can manage say Adam's permissions from a staff level as well. So as you can tell, if you hover over this permission, you'll notice this is, is this is inherited from a staff group. So let's look at a staff group. So based on your staff members, you can see what your entire staff can see. If you're users in groups, they currently can't see any users in groups in them. They should be able to see user groups and be able to filter by them. They generally can see requests, that makes sense. You also want to give them the you know, ability to add and plus sales. So generally, your team cannot see sales by default. They would have to be saying sales or business development division, um, or should I say team, to be able to see sales. Okay. And same with quotes, projects, and such. But what we can do is go to the project managers and go ahead and give access to a project manager division. You can see. And there's no other permission set up, but for project managers, they need to be able to view all project um, items. Okay. But what we limit them by doing is deleting. Okay. So from a good example for a lot of your full-time employees is to make sure they don't have delete access. And if they want to delete things from the system that they need to contact same admin member to do so. Reason for that, again, there's a lot of repercussions from allowing to do that. And that is because if you delete, say, a project, it'll delete all the different milestones and tasks within them. Okay? And same thing with, say, an activity or, say, a client. For example, if you delete a client, it'll delete all the different sales, projects, 
tickets, retainers, invoices, contacts, all from the system, which again, we highly recommend to do not be limited to lead access to only your admin members. Okay. Another good example is billing for a project manager because they are the ones going in and say billing for a given project, maybe for a deposit. We want to give them you know, basically access to billing. We don't want them to be able to export invoices, but or receipts, but we want to give them access to go in and add and edit invoices to make sure it makes sense for the client. Okay. So as you go in, again, you can add in more and more permissions for each individual. But if you go into say Adam, you know, over the course of time, you can have a cumulative amount of different permissions from again different groups that he's in. So if you go back to the administration and the user groups, or just a user, you can go ahead and edit Adam to be say in the project management division to get the permissions that he needs. Now Adam has got more permissions because he's again in that project manager's uh, group. group. Okay. One thing to keep in mind as we're looking at this list screen, again, there's some basic details for a given user, a name, position, email, username, time zone, access level rate. What's important to note is that access level. So if you're quickly looking at a list of your users, and you may have say one, two, 20, 200 users, you're looking at that access level and you're looking at that dollar sign right here. This means they have financial visibility. And in most cases, we could receive a lot of just support requests saying, why can a user do this or that? Why can they see that? Sometimes it comes down to that access level, especially for not being able to edit a project plan, add a project template, or add in a retainer because all of those require budgeting and rates. 